to understand the use of myths in modernist literature, we have to look at the way in which T.S. Eliot in his uh, famous review of James Joyce's novel Ulysses explains the mythical method of James Joyce. Now this mythical method later on became a very important phrase to depict the works of T.S. Eliot and Joyce and also W.B. Yeats who were keen to formulate their works in correspondence with certain ancient myths of uh, various cultures and hence Eliot calls it a mythical method which enabled the literary practitioners of modernist literature like Joyce himself, Eliot himself and Yeats to put order to the contemporary panorama of futility and anar anarchy. So as Eliot writes, if we read this from the essay of Eliot titled Ulysses, Order and Myth which was published in the Dial in 1923, we would see that Eliot is trying to draw our attention to the way in which Joyce tries to build up parallels between contemporaneity and antiquity. So in using the myth, in manipulating a continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity, Mr. Joyce is pursuing a method which others must pursue after him. So he makes this necessary in the very production of literature, in the production of art. So he thinks that others should pursue after him, others should follow James Joyce and try to manipulate a continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity. So that is the myths which are there in antiquity, representative of the older civilizations, older cultures and contemporaneity which is the culture of the West in the early 20th century. They will not be imitators any more than the scientist who uses the discoveries of an Einstein in pursuing his own independent further investigations. Now this very reference to Einstein is very important because uh, Einstein's theory of relativity had already arrived in the discipline of physics by the end of the 19th century and by the beginning of the 20th century and uh, he already turned the Newtonian physics on its head by his theories and uh, what Eliot is suggesting here is that the literary artists like James Joyce are doing a similar service to the nation, service to the domain of art like uh, Einstein was giving service to the domain of science. And then he writes, it is simply a way of controlling, of ordering, of giving a shape and a significance to the immense panorama of futility and anarchy which is contemporary history. This. Uh, phrase the immense panorama of futility and anarchy which is contemporary history is an often 
quoted phrase and uh, it encapsulates the way in which a modernist artist would look at the contemporary world. He would think that the contemporary world is fragmented in nature, it is uh, anarchic in nature and it is futile in the sense it doesn't make any sense in terms of hope, in terms of uh, morality and here if you have uh, seen my other videos especially the video on modernity and the first world war the links to those videos are in the description of this video you would realize that uh, modernism was marked by a pessimism which uh, originated from the, the critique that I am talking about, the critique of modernity, that modernity is not leading us to progress, modernity in the sense of the advancement in science and technology, urbanization, industrialization, the enlightenment principles which uh, tries to foreground the dignity of man, dignity of human reason is not actually leading us to a better world as the, the idea of the artist goes that as we are progressing further in terms of science and technology, in terms of uh, being more urban day by day, being more industrialized day by day, we are actually being spiritually bankrupt. We are being morally degenerated day by day. So hence, this world is full of anarchy, it's a futile world. Also go to the video where I talk about the First World War and how it affected the, the minds of the contemporary artist. The link to that video is also in the description of this video. To know that uh, how the contemporary artist thought about the devastating First World War, which happened during the 19, during 1914 to 1918, and uh, hence this idea of immense panorama of futility and anarchy. The civilization is uh, on the verge of obliteration. It is going to erode. It is going to collapse any time. And this apocalyptic vision makes sense in the literature of the modern. This apocalyptic vision becomes a key image in several writings which were produced by T.S. Eliot, W.B. Yeats and others. So Eliot continues. It is a method already adumbrated by Mr. Yeats, and here he refers to Yeats's poetry, W. B. Yeats's poetry, and of the need for which I believe Mr. Yeats is to have been the first contemporary to be conscious. So he thinks that Yeats was one of the first among his contemporaries to be conscious of the very idea of this mythical method. And then he writes, instead of narrative method, which is telling the tale in a very simplistic manner, in a manner in which conventionally a realist writer in novels would say or would narrate a tale or a poet of the 18th century or 19th century would narrate a tale. So that would be the narrative method. A poet of 18th and 19th century, a predecessor to Eliot, Yeats and of course a novelist from the 19th century, a predecessor to James Joyce would use is according to Eliot the narrative method. 
we may now use the mythical method, method as Eliot writes, instead of narrative method. So, V means he is obviously referring to James Joyce and W. B. Yeats and himself. So, we may now use the mythical method instead of the narrative method. It is, I seriously believe, a step toward making the modern world possible for, for art. So, here he is directly referring to the relationship between art and reality, art and the modern world. The modern world is changing, so we need new methods of representation. And this mythical method is definitely a great way to represent this tremendous panorama of futility and anarchy. Now, to understand this, we may also look at the relation between myth and psychology, which was again gaining its ground during the late 19th century and early 20th century. We have talked about the influence of Sigmund Freud in another video. And please go to the description of this video to see the link to that video. Now, another psychologist, a Swiss psychologist called Carl Jung, who was a disciple of Freud, again emphasized on the collective consciousness or collective unconscious. So, as Freud would talk about the individual unconscious, as he would try to trace the roots of all the external events to the individual unconscious, the libido, the desire, the repressed desires which an individual would have, Jung would emphasize upon the collective unconscious. And uh, individuals in all cultures share this collective unconscious. And this collective unconscious is like a repository of racial memories and of primordial images and patterns of experience. And hence, Jung calls these repositories archetypes, these images archetypes. So, from this later on in the early 20th century and in subsequent phases, you will find that uh, a particular school of criticism developed from this, which is known as archetypal criticism. So, literary works like myths open a window to such repositories. So, through the myths, by studying the myths, by studying the literary works, you can know about these archetypes, these collective unconscious, this particular collective unconscious domain of every civilization. And there are similarities among them. And hence, it was uh, this this very mode of criticism was uh, lauded by the structuralist critics later on in the 1950s and 60s, when structuralism came to the world of theory and criticism. Now, uh, if we look at the mythical method adopted by Eliot we need to acknowledge that he makes this mythical method a necessary component of modernist literature. And he thinks that it allows the embattled present to find roots in the deepest strata of the Indo-European past, especially in its mythic unconscious, if you use the Jungian term. And he makes this particularly evident in the wasteland. And notice in the wasteland, he is not only talking about the Western myths only, the Anglo American myths only, but he is also referring or using the myths which would be found in the Upanishads. So he is using the Hindu myths as well. And uh, we already know that he studied Sanskrit in Harvard, so that knowledge became a cultural capital for him.